Welcome to the Tough Fish Show. I am so excited to bring to you Lindsay Ward. Lindsay, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me today. I am so glad you're here, and I'd love for you to start with how'd you get into writing? Oh, that's funny. Um, <laughs> I, well, I say it's funny because I didn't plan to be a writer, actually. I never, I never even considered it. Um, my first job was working in a children's bookstore when I was 15, and that's what made me want to be an illustrator because I was meeting all these other authors and illustrators, and I just loved what they did, and I I loved drawing and my parents were artists so that I knew I wanted to do something art related. So I started as an illustrator and went to school for illustration and never in a million years thought I was going to be a writer. Um, and then let's see, I think I believe it, my first agent was convinced that I was and I was like, okay, and didn't really take it to heart. Um, but I, at the time I had a story that I was playing around with, which ended up being when Bloom met Egg. And she was like, just write it, just write it. And, and I ended up writing something else um, before I got to that one, but she was very encouraging of it. Um, and it's funny because now I can't imagine not writing. Um, and I actually have projects coming out in 2024 where I'm not the illustrator, um, where there'll be my author only picture books, which I'm really excited about. It's kind of nice to step out of my own head and let someone else worry about it <laughs> so um That's awesome. yeah so it happened by accident really I love that okay so I personally I love to draw but my stick okay. men they're fantastic <laughs> for myself but that's about it so with your background to be able to illustrate do you think in the pictures and then the story comes or do you think of the story and then the pictures the illustration starts to take shape and does it change on you as you're just continuing to bring that illustration to life? That's a good question. I think uh, when I think about it now, I think I've always approached it as a writer. I just didn't really think of it like that because I don't start with images. I definitely start with a story. So one of the things that always appealed to me for illustrating children's books was that you had a narrative to work with. Like I was never going to be somebody who was a fine artist and was just going to like paint something because I, like I have, I, I, I have to have a starting point, whether that's a, an idea for a story or, I mean, occasionally I'll have a visual pop into my head. That's like what a character looks like, but it's definitely more word driven, I think, initially than, you know, illustration driven, which is interesting now that I think about it, because I did come as an illustrator first. So you would think it was the other way around. But I, I do start with a story or an idea of some kind first, usually. Okay, that, see, I think that's really cool. So for me, I actually would see it as the picture for at least my children's books. Oh, I saw the images in my mind, and then was trying to how do I articulate what I'm seeing so that I can, or so that it comes to life like it's I see it in my mind. So I okay. I love the balance there. That's cool. It's a it's an interesting thing to kind of like uh, my husband writes and he thinks like a film, like cinematic way he thinks about storytelling and it's fascinating to me because I think more the frames, right? Because it's page turn and as the illustrator, whereas he sees it as a whole sequence. And it's sometimes when we have dialogues about that, it's like, you know, he wants to get a point across visually. And I'm like, right, but we, it's 2D. Like we have to pause and show that movement or that, you know, expression or whatever. And it's, um, it's so fat, just, it's fascinating to me. Like you're saying, like you think the opposite, you know, how it's visual first. And, um, everybody approaches it differently. It's just fascinating. It is fascinating. And so when you are going about your illustrations, you have the story written, you're going through your illustrations. How many turns do you kind of go through till you say, this is, this is the image, this is the picture I want for this particular scene or this stanza or what have you? Because uh, you know, at least as a writer, you're going through that iteration so many times and it might change the illustration in some way. It might, it may not, at least the intent might be there. So I'm curious as to 
when you're working on your own, how do you work through that? It's really hard. <laughs> um, I think I'm much better at knowing when to stop visually. Like, uh, I will say, like, in, I think I'm intuitively more of an illustrator first because I don't needle the art as much as I do when I write, like where I go back and go back and go back and go back until it's, and I, I always think of like, like with writing, I always think of it like J.D. Salinger had this great quote once about how every word he agonized over, like every single one. And I feel like that's how I am with text. It's like, because we have such a short amount of, or small amount of real estate to work with in a picture book manuscript, it's like every single word matters. And and the rhythm and the sound and everything. But with art, I feel like I'm not somebody who keeps like sketchbooks filled and like does bazillions of sketches prior. That's just not really, I, I, I think of myself as a much more cerebral artist before I sit down. Like I spend a lot of time thinking about it so that by the time I sit down, I just do it. And that's not to say that I don't make mistakes or revise the art, but I don't do it nearly as much as I think a lot of my friends do. Um, I have some friends that are illustrators and I see the, the process they grow. And it's, I'm like, no, I would never have the patience for that. Like I just, you know, where it's like multiple outfits or multiple hair colors or multiple, like I just work on it until it feels right. It feels more of an intuitive process than anything else. And there are times I wish I was more like that because I wonder what the work would maybe be like on the other side but I but I also think that like you know we all approach things our own way and and I, it wouldn't really be authentic in my process if I did try to do I, I I'd probably go crazy if I had to sit there and um so I, I think with the art I definitely spend a lot less time sitting down and puzzling it over physically than I do with the writing and I'll tend to stay away from stuff for a while like I did a book last was it last year that it came out? The, the last three years are a blur. Um, Between the Lines came out in fall of 2021. And that was a story that was written in 2016 and sold later. And I was terrified of that manuscript. Absolutely terrified of it. Even, even though it was mine, I was really scared of it and didn't want to sit down with it because I knew it was going to be really hard and I was going to have to stretch myself artistically to do it. So I avoided it for a while and put it off and was like, maybe somebody else can illustrate it. And so, but I, once I finally figured it out and after spending all this time thinking about it, then I was able to just sit down and do it. And it just came out. So I think that's more how I approach it. Okay. You have than, done so many cool yeah. things here. <laughs> so, I feel like that was a really long answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, that was great. Because to me, uh, I heard a few things that I would love to explore a little bit please one of which sure. is the fact that you know there is that longer process to where you started one story and then it did, it needed some time before as you said it got sold it so picked up by the agent to then pick up with the mm -hmm. publisher what was that process like how, how did you know you found the right agent therefore the right publisher how, how did you know that that felt right for you that book in particular was really tricky because it was, um, so I've had a few different, I mean, I've been doing this almost 15 years. So I've had a few different agents at this point. Most, uh, most of them have, we parted ways because they left the industry altogether. Um, I've been very lucky to work with some really phenomenal women who all taught me something along the way. Um, but with Between the Lines, I, at the time, the agent I was with was not interested in taking that project out. Mm -hmm. And it, it ended up being along with a lot of other projects that I was doing at the time, kind of a crossroads of projects I was really passionate about that I wanted to do that weren't going to see the light of day if I didn't fight for them. Um, and so I had to make that really tough decision of like, is it worth continuing with, with the same representation, um, if it means that I don't get to do these projects, uh, or is it okay to make a change, which is really scary. You know, I think in our industry, we get so 
you know, we put the, the agents and the editors on these pedestals, right? And, and it's very hard to walk away from a potential relationship or an existing relationship that's terrifying. Um, but I think it's really important to also remember that like they, none of them have jobs without us. Like, so it's, it's important to stick with your creative integrity. And if you're really passionate about something, then you have to see it through. Right. So I made a really hard decision to part ways, um, with my agent at a time. And, and she was fantastic. No ill will, nothing just it was just a time, it was time to change because there were some projects I wanted to pursue. And, um, and then I shared it with an existing editor at the time. And she had, we went back and forth on revisions. I really didn't think it was going to land. Um, and then she ended up acquiring it. And so, you know, from when it was written in 2016 to when it came out in 2021, it was, it was a battle <laughs> to get it made. Um, but I was really passionate about it. And, and I, I'm really glad that I put it out there and, and fought to have it. And it's interesting too, because the reviews for that book, it's, there's no gray area. People either absolutely love it or they don't get it at all. But I'm okay with that because I think it's supposed to be a little open-ended. Um, so it, that one was a battle. A lot of times I feel like that's not the case. Like it's a little bit smoother, but that particular title was just for whatever reason. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how, how that one went. Well, but you've hit something that I think is really important to, to emphasize that sometimes it's not about the relationship, not being good, so to speak anymore, that there's a falling out. Sometimes it's a matter of recognizing I think it's reached the end of its season and finding yeah. a way to say, oh, I think if that is the case, how do I do this peacefully? How do I do this smoothly mm -hmm. so that this transition is kind for everyone in, involved? Because that's going to, that, that you kind of feel that and you can see that, but it takes courage to make that transition to say, I think that this has reached the end of the season and I need to do something different. Even if I don't know what different means yet, I still think that this is the right thing to do. So I appreciate that you shared that. That's really important. It was, it was really, I remember it being very scary at the time because prior to that, the only reason I had changed agents ever was because like I had said, they had left. So there, there wasn't a choice. It was just, you know, either reshifting within an agency or finding a new agent entirely. Um, and that one was really, it was really hard to make that decision. I learned so much from that agent and I'm internally grateful to her for various things that she taught me. She made me a better author and illustrator, hands down. I wouldn't be where I went, where I am today without her. Um, and I think, but to your point, you're right. Like, I think you get to a point where you know, you shift and change and creatively want to maybe go in different directions. And I, each person I've worked with has taught me something. Um, some, th there's been a big lesson with each of them. And I'm really grateful for that because I, I think it's like you, you know, learn what, something from the first one, then build to the next and then build. And, it, and it's made me better with each person. Um, the change part is hard, of course, because it's scary. And, you know, you're like, am I ever going to have an agent again? And, but I also think that um, it's very easy to forget that there are people too, like that if they're not 100% behind something, do you really want that person selling it for you anyway? You want them to be excited about it because it makes their job better for them too. And so I think it's okay for that to shift. And it, it doesn't mean that it was a bad relationship or that it didn't, you know, there's ill will or anything like that. It's just, you, sh you people change people. And I think creatively it would be stagnant if you didn't to change and be interested in different things. I love that so, so much. I'm so glad you said that. So one of the things I know you do within your business, and it's really a nice way to kind of help other writers and illustrators is the, the critter lit. Could you talk a little bit about that? I just, I think that that is so cute. I love the name. I love the idea. Yeah. 
Um, I, you know, I remember, I think I, I started it in early 2017 and it kind of was a result of just hearing, I think general frustration that we as authors and illustrators feel in this industry where you're trying to, everything is at a glacial pace in publishing. And, and that can be so difficult. I mean, even 15 years in, I still get impatient with how long things take sometimes. And I, I just felt for people who were trying to get their stories out there and they just want feedback. It, it, like to have a, a reference point of like, where do I go with this? You know, and waiting six months to get that is awful. So I think that was kind of, um, you know, it was part of it was how I felt when I first started out. I mean, I remember sending out postcards to art directors and like, it was a black hole, you know, you would send this stuff out and you never know if anybody saw it or, or what they thought of it. And, and it would just linger and you're just hopeful, but it, that gets hard after a while. And I remember doing three years of that when I graduated college and, and just like hoping for the best and wanting to give up many times, you know, and I was lucky enough that things kind of clicked into place eventually, but I, I would meet these other authors or illustrators and it's hard. It's really hard. I mean, writing is such a solitary thing to begin with that, you know, you, I think you need a support system because it is so, you know, internal. And I wanted to be able to do that. I was like, you know, I could handle reading picture books. Um, I try to keep it reasonable because of course the whole point is that the first one is free on Critterlit is that any, you can submit a picture book, 800 words or less, it's less hopefully because it's, unless it's nonfiction, it really shouldn't be 800 words, but, um, and I will read it and give you feedback within two weeks. And I remember when I first started, I was like, can I do this? Like, do I have the time for this? Because, you know, I have a lot of different deadlines and I have three kids at home and my husband and I both work from home and we juggle that together. And, um, but it felt really important to be able to give back to the community that was so supportive to me when I first started. And so I think the way I kind of managed doing the free ones was that if it was additional ones by the same person, then it was for a fee just so that I wasn't completely inundated with, um, you know, a, a ton all at all the time. So it's been a really good, it's been a really good experience. And the really cool thing is that now, because since 2017, I've now seen books that I got to critique that are now books themselves, which is very cool to see them come to life and get to see them on a shelf. And it's like, oh my God, I saw that when it was in its infancy and now it's a real book. And um, so that part of it has been really cool. And then I do the weekly interviews for people as well, which is, I just think it's, you know, it's hard enough to get your book out there as a debut that if that small bit can help promote it, then, you know, I want to be able to be a part of that. I love that. I love that you do that so, so much because you're right. When you're writing, when you're writing a picture book, to your point with a word limit, you are trying to encapsulate a story you're, or a message or both and be as succinct and as clear and as fun as a, and engaging. There are a lot of pieces that are going into that and you're trying to reach the right reading level too. So you're, you're, there's a lot of pieces that go in and to have another set of eyes who's been there, who's done that, who understands. I think that that's such a beautiful thing to offer. Do you have any suggestions or tips as if somebody is trying to figure out for themselves, like, what should I be looking for? You mean in terms of their story or mm -hmm. their, sure. I think it's, I think it's a matter of, I mean, I would say the biggest mistake I see is that people don't do their research. I think there's a lot of people that, and I'm sure everybody has this story because it happens to me at parties all the time where it's like, oh, because we're kind of unicorns. Like people don't meet people that do what we do. So like on a, on a regular basis. So I feel like, you know, in a social setting, when people find out what I do, either they have an idea that they've had forever or, you know, and, and every once in a while, somebody will surprise me, 
But I think that most people don't understand what goes into it. And so the first thing I always tell people is that if you do have an idea and you do want to break into this, like learn about the industry, go to your library and learn about what, what books are current. And especially if you don't have kids in the age of picture books, you're not being inundated with those materials. So it's important to know what is relevant in the market today, because arguably most classics, like you'd never sell, be able to sell today. They'd either be too long or they'd be, um, the topics would be a little off, off color or, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult to kind of say that, oh, well, I'm familiar with what I grew up with. Therefore I know what's relevant today. And that's just not really the case. So I think it's important to go out and kind of get a sense of like what's out there. And also if you do have an, an idea in mind, look at the books that are in that vein and will your book fill that hole? I think you have to find, you know, it's, it's so competitive, right? So you have to find a way, like, how am I going to sell this as something that the market needs? And, and, and it's such a fine line because on the one hand, you have editors who want you to give them comp titles and say, well, it's like this and it's like this, but it fills this hole, which is so difficult because if it's completely new, then nothing should be like it. So I, I think that that part of it is huge. The research part of it is a big, a big part, like know what you're getting into. And then if you want to pursue it, then by all means, but I think there's a lot of like blind jumps that happen in this industry. And I, and I hear from those people later and they're like, I had no idea, you know? Um, and so I think, yeah, the research part is what I would say is the biggest tip probably. That's a great tip. So with one of the things I know you also did, especially before the pandemic is our school visits. So when you do a school visit, how is it that you blend both the illustrations and the writing? Because I would imagine that you coming and talking because you have both skill sets would be a really fun experience for the kids. That was actually the hardest part professionally during the pandemic was just that that just completely ended. You know, it was like, and I remember hearing a lot of other authors talk about that too. It's just, it's not the same. You know, you would try to read books aloud on Zoom and, and you're not, first of all, you're looking at yourself. You're not looking at them when you're sharing a screen or whatever, or you're, you're looking at your art. And it's just, it's about like, I remember thinking the first time I read Dexter aloud virtually, it was like, oh, this just doesn't work. Like, it's just, you know, it's meant to be in person. And so I, I, I feel like that's starting to come back. Usually I would do assemblies with large groups. I mostly do elementary school, of course, because it's uh, picture books. But um, I also have like one-off workshops that I do with kids for creative writing and then um, learning how to use collage or um, this book is gray has come out, which has a lot of like color theory uh, in, in that series. I started doing more um, workshops where I'm teaching kids about primary and secondary colors and color relationships and things like that. So I do kind of a mix. It really just depends on what the school wants. You know, if they want to just do large assembly style or if they want to do workshops or um, so it just depends, but I do love to go and I love to read books aloud with them and share the process because that's another thing. Most people don't understand how long it takes to make a book and what's involved, you know, and the fact that even though my name's on the front of it, there's a whole team of people that you have working with you. And, um, so that part of it is really fun to kind of go through with them. And then just sharing the work with them is is great, you know, and being able, and then I usually teach them how to draw a character too, which is really fun as well. So it's a great oh. experience. And for, you know, it's just, it's just really fun. I think when you get out to school visits, you remember that there's all these little people having experiences that you don't even know with your work. They're reading it with their parents. And it's just mind boggling. Cause I, I think you get so used to just your studio and what's happening with you. And you forget that like your book is being read by people you'll never meet. And that's so surreal to think about sometimes. So, but yeah. I love them. I love school visits. <laughs> yes, yes, I do. I do too. I think that they're just, it's such a joy. And you mentioned something that I think is so cool about how you have books with the colors. And the one in particular that has, that caught my eye was pink is not a color. Yeah. And, she, and your little <laughs> character, she looks so adamant, like, oh. so. <laughs> Would you talk I had about a lot of fun that? doing that one. Um, so pink is a, 
it's a sequel to this book is gray. And I, I had, I got the idea for it when I was working on this book is gray, um, which started from a conversation. I was had a conversation with my agent at the time. And we were talking about, I was saying that I really wanted to do a color theory book. And that I just had this idea of how funny it would be if two complementary colors like blue and orange were actually complementing each other. And then like, how would these colors feel and how would they interact? And so gray got written and it was one of those manuscripts where I was like, I don't know what people are going to think of this. And my agent at the time loved it. And we, we sold it quickly on an exclusive submission. And then when I was doing gray, I came across this article, which I talk a little bit about in the back matter for um, pink is not a color. I came across an article where scientists were arguing about whether or not pink was a real color because it's not something we actually can see. It is a glitch, so to speak. We can see red and violet light um, and blue light, but we can't see pink light. And so it's, it's because they're next to each other. It gets complicated because there's like pigment color and light color, but in our, our brain doesn't see actually see pink color. It's something our brain overrides to see it because red and and uh blue are next to each other on the light spectrum so and i just thought that was so fascinating to me because they were like well it's not a real color and i'm like but it's pink it's everywhere like you know like and i that i to me that seems so funny like how would pink as a color react who is arguably an extremely popular color react to being told that she might not be a color and what kind of identity crisis does that look like? And so that was where the idea came from. So when I finished Gray, I was hopeful that I would get to come back to Pink. Um, and thankfully, Gray did very well. So I was able to do another one. And so that was kind of how Pink came together. I love that so much because I really like Pink. Too. So I, was, I, think <laughs> I do too. Just... I do too. I feel it's such a happy, bright. And I love my oldest. It's one of his favorite colors, which I love. Um, he's, it's, he, and I think it's because red is his favorite color and pink is kind of like, and he understands that it's a tint. I find that I'm, you know, kind of lean into that more and embrace it more because everything is like very rough and tumble at my house. So it was fun to do a book that was so bright and cheery. And, um, I don't know, it was, just, it was just really nice to do. So I, I had a lot of fun with that one. I love that. Lindsay, this has been so cool. I have so enjoyed listening to the how you ebb and flow between writing and illustrating and just I can hear the pieces coming together and just love how you've done that thank you so much where can people connect with you you and where can they get your books my website which is lindsaymward.com and there's links for everything there and you can get books in bookstores local bookstores and also on amazon um and also Critter Lit, if you are an aspiring author and you want me to take a look, uh, it's just CritterLit.com. And you can sign up for our newsletter. We do like interviews once a week and stuff like that. So there's lots of different helpful tips and things like that on that site as well. Lindsay, this has been awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, thank you for having me. It was really nice to get to talk about books and the process and everything. So thank you.